Welcome everyone to today's meeting of the Jewish Parents Forum convened by the Tikva Fund. We're here to discuss an ugly and unpleasant subject, the resurgence of anti-Semitism and the dangers that violence directed at Jews could pose to the people that we care the most about, our children. <clears throat> uh, this is something we need to talk about. I've been having this experience at distressingly frequent intervals. You log on to Facebook or Twitter, and you're scrolling along looking at vacation pictures from friends and colleagues, and you see that person that you went to high school with, and you see the titles of the new pieces from commentary, and then there's an ad from Starbucks, and then, right there, scrolling below the ad from Starbucks, you have another tweet from the New York City Police Department's, you know, Crime Stopper tip line, looking for information on an assault on a Haredi Jew in Brooklyn. And you watch the video, and a young man pursues a Hasid walking on the streets and takes a wild swing at him for no reason, and punches him in the back, and then sprints back into the shadows. And you sit there, and you're looking at that, and you just, you can't imagine it, it's terrible. And then you scroll on, and there's a post from the Wall Street Journal about Ukraine, and then a post from my kid's day school, and then a picture of what my cousin cooked for dinner last night, and then there's a retweet of a post by Williamsburg News that yeshiva buses were graffitied with swastikas in the middle of the night. And as I say, you just it feels like you're seeing this more and more. And there's no great public outcry about it, an outcry that other American communities expect when they're harassed, and an outcry that they often receive. And you just start to feel unsettled, and not to say disgusted. And then something more dramatic happens. Like a British jihadi flies across the Atlantic Ocean to take hostages at a small synagogue in Coleyville, Texas, to pressure the U.S. government to release an Al-Qaeda operative being held in federal prison. And, and when you logged back onto your phone that Saturday night and saw what had transpired that day, all Jewish parents everywhere in the country, I know, had the same thought. That lunatic could have come to my synagogue. He could have come to my kid's school. He could have come to our summer camp. So today we're convened to just try to understand what's happening in our country, to get an assessment of the threat landscape facing American Jewry in very practical terms, and then to try to analyze and think about what it means. My name is Jonathan Silver. I'm the editor of Mosaic and the host of the Tikva podcast. I want to welcome you on behalf of the sponsors of the Jewish Parents Forum, principally Rebecca Sugar, Carolyn Rowan, Liz Lang, and Nina Davidson. Thank you guys for your leadership. We launched the Jewish Parents Forum in November 2021 to arm parents with ideas, advice, opportunities to learn together and to meet one another, all focused on the mission of raising the next generation of Jewish and Zionist leaders with moral confidence and civic courage from grade school to high school and to college. This is part of a, this, uh, today's meeting is part of a five-part series. In a moment, we're going to hear from Richard Prem, COO and Deputy National Director of the Community Security Service, and then commentary editor John Podhoritz and I will try to put this moment into some American context. And finally, in about 40 minutes time, we'll have some time left for your questions. So uh, that's just to, uh, to orient us. Richard, let me uh, start with you and see if you can just, because I think it's relevant to the way that you see things unfolding in the streets of America and in front of our institutions, Tell us a little bit about your background and uh, the experience you bring to your role. Richard, you, uh, unmute yourself, yeah. Thank, thank you, Jonathan, and, and thank you, Tikva Fund, for, for having me. Um, uh, my name is Richard Prem, and as you can probably hear, I have an accent. I'm originally from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And uh, sadly, when I grew up, you know, that's when news reports started appearing in European press about rising levels of anti-Semitism. And as a, a grandson of Holocaust survivors, I, I wanted to do something about it. So when I turned 18, I started to volunteer to protect my synagogue against threats. And I joined the official security organization of the, of the Jewish community. I did that for a few years, moved to Israel, served in a special forces unit there, and went back to the Netherlands to take a leading role in that security organization. Um, it was a difficult time because, you know, I'm someone who's not necessarily identifiably Jewish. When you stand in front of a Jewish building or you, you know, or, or if you are identifiably Jewish, you experience a lot more 
of the, the threats that are taking place because people know where to find you or they know how to target you. But after doing that, I decided to, to do my graduate studies in the United States. I moved to DC. I went to the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. And I thought now I can do something else than working on Jewish or, or Israeli issues. And I, I moved to Thailand to, to work for a member of the royal family there to set up a research institute within the Ministry of Justice uh, on security. And, and as I was there, there were a bunch of military coup. And I thought maybe it's not the best time to be working for the Thai government. And I switched to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And for the next few years, I was working on terrorism prevention and countering organized crime groups in Southeast Asia. That career track brought me to New York, where I ended up as a counterterrorism advisor to the United Nations Security Council. It was an interesting time. I don't know what was more dangerous being in the, in the IDF or being former IDF at the UN. But that said, I did get to do very, very interesting uh, work, but many in, in, in third world countries, Africa, South Asia, and helping governments uh, develop counterterrorism uh, policies and protocols. But as I was doing that, Pittsburgh happened. You know, and I grew up as a, as a Jew from Europe thinking that there's two places in the world where Jews do not have to worry about anti-Semitism. One is Israel, where we're the majority, and the other is the United States, because as a naive European Jew, we think everything is better in, in America. But when Pittsburgh happened, I thought, why am I working on Tanzania and Cote d'Ivoire and helping them with counterterrorism? And right here in my backyard, and, and at this point, I was, I was married, my wife is American, we have a son. Um, and there's these threats emerging right here. And I wanted to get back and, and bring some of the skills I had to the, to the Jewish space. So I joined the Anti-Defamation League, became their director for international affairs out of New York. And one of the things I did there is develop a protocol for the organization on how to respond to terrorist attacks. How can, what can ADL do uh, if there is an attack like Pittsburgh or Poway to liaise between law enforcement and the community? And right as, as I developed that, Jersey City happened. And we got to implement it at MMC. So when I was asked after that to, to join the Community Security Service, which is a, a nonprofit modeled around that security organization that I had in the Netherlands and the Jewish communities around the world have had for decades, uh, it was an easy uh, transition for me. So I, I joined and I've been now for the last two years working at CSS and we're basically helping to protect synagogues, Jewish institutions, events, to protect themselves by empowering community members, by training community members uh, um, uh, in, in volunteer security routines to, to do active uh, access control, perimeter control, counter surveillance uh, uh, to keep our community uh, safe. So um, I hope that gives a little bit of a picture of who I am, and I'm happy to to, to be here and, and share anything I can do to to be helpful. I, th I think you're. Excuse me. So, so now the f the first question that I, I would just want to ask, I suppose, is uh, if there's any empirical basis to a feeling that I that I have that I outline that I think many people share. It just seems like the the uh, the incidents of anti-Semitism, both, both uh, harassment and even physical threats of violence seems to be escalating. Well, the, if you look at the data, um, uh, there, there's no way of sugarcoating it. There is, a, there is a serious problem. If you look at the data from the FBI for the last two years, uh, around 60% of all religiously motivated hate crimes targeted the Jewish community. 2019, it was 63%. Uh, in 2020, it was 58%. Uh, in both cases, the, over, the absolute majority of all religiously motivated hate crimes targeted Jews, only 2% of the population. And, and similarly, if you look at the ADL, which has been tracking anti-Semitic incidents since the 1970s, uh, for the last few years, you've consistently seen over 2,000 uh, reported anti-Semitic incidents, the highest since they started tracking 40 years ago. And, and with that, you also have to take into account that we're talk, talking about reported incidents. Uh, I don't need to tell you that a lot of incidents go, go underreported. I'm not only talking about members of our community who don't want to go through the trouble, if they're being yelled at, if they're being shouted at, or if somebody harassed them to, to go to police to make, uh, uh, to file a report. But even some, you know, police stations around the country, we have seen police stations in, in big countries, sorry, in big cities, who have mentioned their zero uh, bias crimes in their, in their district. And often it has to do with that they haven't been trained in how to process them. So, we just have to keep in mind that when we talk about the number of reported incidents, we're talking about the tip of the iceberg. And, uh, and, and if you, we're merely looking at the data, you, you have to uh, come to a conclusion that we are in a time period that uh, anti-Semitic incidents and hate crimes are at uh, very high levels. Okay, so I mean, uh, the, the thing that prompted us to organize this event is obviously what happened in Colleyville. Uh, I want to come back to that a little later in our discussion. But now, just give us a sense of uh, the sort of threats that uh, usually are encountered. Meaning, one, as I say, you, you scroll through your phone and you see 
um, you, you see men on the streets of Brooklyn being punched in the head. Is that what we're talking about? What, what are the sort of things that you're seeing um, that's most prevalent? So th th I think there's two ways of looking at it. I think you, you have um, hate crimes and, and, and that are, you know, that can be ad hoc decisions that are made. Somebody is walking by someone who harbors anti-Semitic feelings, uh, uh, makes a decision in the act to, to act upon those feelings and harass someone, vandalize something or, or even assault an individual. And then there's the more uh, sophisticated threats that our community faces. But my organization is focused on whether it's terrorism from, from international terrorist group like Al Qaeda, ISIS, whether it's white supremacists, whether it's lone wolves who radicalize themselves in, in, in their basement, or this uh, a hybrid a situation like something that would happen in, in, in Colleyville, where someone uh, um, influenced by, by an international uh, idea and an, an affiliation um, uh, ideologically to an international group decided to travel uh, across the Atlantic to, to perpetrate his attack. And, and the one thing I will say about those kind of threats, the, I would say the, I won't say the one is more serious than the other because they're all serious, but in the more organized attacks on, on our community, there, there's two things that most of them historically have had in common. And this is good to know because it also provides us an opportunity. The first is uh, uh, not something we can do a whole lot about here. And that is that they're motivated by antisemitism. Um, you know, even in a situation like Colleyville, where there might have been multiple motives at place, like trying to get someone released from prison and, and holding hostages to that purpose, the whole reason why the perpetrator picked the, uh, the synagogue was because he had an anti-Semitic worldview that he felt that by taking Jews hostage, he would might get more done. Um, but that's the one thing that all these attacks on Jewish targets have in common. But the other thing that, and I'm talking about nearly every attack from Jersey City to Power to Pittsburgh to what happened in Marseille and Paris and and, and Halle, Germany. In nearly all attacks on Jew Jewish targets, the perpetrator spent significant time conducting research, reconnaissance, or surveillance of their target. And us, we community members, we can help identify those kind of suspicious activities, those kind of indicators, and take certain steps to make ourselves less vulnerable that will make our institutions harder targets, and it allows us to prevent and deter attacks on our community. So, Richard, I mean, that's very valuable. Part of the purpose of our convening together today is to offer concerned parents very practical uh, advice and guidance. The things that we should be asking our synagogues and schools to make sure that they're adopting best practices to keep our children safe and our, and our congregants safe. So, I mean, to begin with, when you show up to assess the threat readiness of a synagogue, what are you looking for? What should we be looking for? I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think in general, in security, we talk about the three Ps. It's people, it's procedures, and it's physical. And with physical, we mean like any kind of barriers or cameras or CCTV equipment or reinforced doors or bulletproof windows. That's all part of what we consider the physical. And then you have the procedures around, you know, who is responsible for what, uh, who opens the door, who closes the door. Um, and, and, and that links to the third P, which is around uh, people. And one thing that I consistently see, and this is something that I think is, 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 is a huge opportunity for us, for parents to, to get involved in, is that I've been to synagogues who've had the most high-tech security equipment, you know, alarm buttons, talking uh, robots that walk through the building and, and have the AI capacity to recognize gunshots. But when I walk to the back of the building, where there's a big reinforced door, and this is in the middle of summer, I see a big brick between the door and the wall because people open it up to get fresh air into the sanctuary and nobody afterwards uh, a close up. So obviously uh, for us, the, the most important thing is to train the people, to have a sense of collective awareness around our security, to make sure that when parents do bring their, their kids to school, that they understand that it's not just the school's responsibility. And I will have some recommendations on what questions you can ask uh, your institutions, whether it's a school or it's a synagogue, to sort of you know uh, keep them alert and make sure that they're taking precautions that they should. But when you are walking to your synagogue or when you're walking to your school, uh, you have you are part of the solution. You're part of, of the defensive shield. If, if you see a, a door that is left open, if you see someone lingering around asking weird questions or taking pictures or, or sitting in a car, you as a parent have, have a responsibility. You have an opportunity to do something about it. And I'll give you an example of what happened a few months ago in Marseille in France. Parents, parents trained by our sister organization in, in France, where, who brought their kids to school, decided to do a, 
a little check in the area before they went home. And they saw an individual sitting in a car fixated on the entrance. And as they approached this person to stop him, this person came out, carried a knife. They were able to, to, to stop this attacker, uh, prevent him from hurting anyone. And he had come to that school to attack children, similarly as 10 years earlier had happened at a Jewish school in Toulouse. Who were able to make a difference? Not um, you know, private security guards or law enforcement who luckily were in the area as well, but concerned parents, parents who knew their community, parents who knew what times kids will be arriving and leaving, parents that knew that is someone that I don't recognize, parents who cared. And, and that's something that I want to sort of sort of the first recommendation that I would give is that we all have an opportunity to, to help with our collective security. And because you know your community better, because you know your, your school, your institutions, uh, 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 your, your synagogues better, you are much better equipped to recognize when something is out of place and something is unusual. And by reporting and, and, and acting upon that, you can help prevent attacks. So that's the the, and the recommendation I would give everyone on this call that they can become active participants in their own security. But there's also some practical questions that you can ask. You know, if, you, if you're wondering about the security procedures at, at, at your institution, like you can ask them, is there, is there an evacuation plan? Are there lockdown procedures? Uh, how often do staff check the alarm systems and the emergency exits? The last thing you wanna be is in a situation where there, there is a situation where you need to evacuate. And there's a bunch of boxes or construction taking place preventing the emergency exits. And I cannot tell you how many times I've seen things like that. Um, do you know who you should report something to? I just mentioned what you can do when you walk to and from your institutions. Do you know who the point person is that you should report something to? Um, do they have a, a guards and how are the guards operating? Are they standing at the entrance? Are they looking around? Are they uh, proactive? And, um, and you can ask some specific questions like what is the protocol? Uh, if there's a threat, a bomb threat, what is the protocol if a kid mentions that somebody asked strange question or they were approached by someone? You want to feel that your institution has thought about these questions and has plans in place. And then it's a matter of organizing you know, that they also do the regular drills and, and practice and, and briefings of their staff and their, uh, and their congregants, if, if relevant, to, to make sure that not only do they have these protocols in place, but are also ready to use in case of an emergency. So what I'd like to do is, you know, for, for the next few minutes is go back to Culleyville. And, you know, we all read the press coverage of what happened there. But you would have seen dimensions of what unfolded that would be harder for us to see. We're not security professionals. So, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to trivialize or, 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 God forbid, criticize anything that anyone did there. But I think it would be useful if we could sort of take that as a case study of what how an attack might unfold and tell us what what the people there, what the rabbi did right, what he might have now, now what we can learn from so that we don't repeat. Just sort of walk us through what happened. So, so the first I want to say, like, it's always easy to Monday morning quarterback, right? And I don't want to put myself in a position where I'm doing it. And I want to state clearly that, that what the rabbi and the congregants did, the way they uh, uh, got themselves to safety is heroic. And, and we should celebrate that. Uh, but there are a few things that from a security perspective, you, you immediately look at. Like what I hear that this person arrived a few weeks before, that he was already in the Dallas area a week before he perpetrated his attack. I wanna know whether any other targets that he considered, did he do any reconnaissance of this target? Why did he choose to, to target this particular institution? A lot of this data is coming out over, a lot of this information is coming out as the investigation involved. But one thing that I think is interesting to point out is that has already been disclosed by law enforcement is that he did search online for the website of the Bet, uh, congregation Bet Israel. And there's a lot of uh, uh, synagogues that I, I look on their website and I can not only follow their life services, but I can also look up all the names of their members, their board members. I can look back one or two to the beginning of COVID to see all the virtual services, services if it is a conservative or reform denomination to see you know, what they have done. How hard is it to create a little uh, um, password protected member side of the website that makes it a little bit harder to, to find out information about what time services are taking place. Anything that might get, give information around which entrance is being used. I've seen websites that say, because of construction, use so-and-so entrance. Trying to be a little bit more conscious around, our, around the information that we put out there is one of the lessons that I, I see here from uh, uh, just by the fact, the sheer fact that we have already evidence that uh, uh, this person was, was searching online and there are around a dozen synagogues around a similar distance from where 
he was staying most of the time. So, so the first thing I ask is, you know, how did he pick this target? Did he conduct reconnaissance of this car? He apparently was one hour before near the site at a Starbucks, and then he cycled there. So obviously, what did he do? Was there any kind of attack preparation? And so th that is for me and for people in my uh, uh, seats um, um, where we're, we're mostly looking at, because obviously active shooter training and being able to, to uh, run fight heights if you get to, to an emergency is important. And, uh, and it helps in this particular case. But we also have to be honest and say that this was not an active shooter. This person came in to hold hostages and try to get someone released from prison and he held them hostage for 11 hours. If he would have walked in like in Pittsburgh or Poway and immediately started shooting, we might not be celebrating this outcome. So for me, how can we prevent someone from entering? And, uh, and the lessons we can derive from that is to look at what happened prior to the attack. And in this case, you know, did the person, could they have been spotted? Could there be protocols in place that certain questions could have been asked in a way that he, that person wouldn't have been allowed into the synagogue yet? These are the kind of things that we're looking at. And I think uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to learn from it. But if there's one thing, and I'll, I'll share this, you know, that, that all the recent attacks in the U.S. had in common, whether it's Pittsburgh, Poway, Jersey City, Muncie, Brighton and Boston, or, or now in Colleyville, it is the ease with which the attackers were able to walk into their building. We need to think as a community more about access control, about perimeter control. And it's not the coincidence. It's not just because, oh, it's so easy. It's also because they might have picked other targets first and then realized that they do have a robust security presence. So let me try to find a softer target. So by thinking of it like from the prevention angle, rather like what do I do in the emergency? I think there's a lot of lessons from this incident, like all the other incidents. And, and our goal should not be to run, fight and hide. Our goal should be is to get to a situation where they will think twice about targeting our institutions, that we can prevent, detect and disrupt any kind of preparation for an attack. And if you do, are not in a situation where we have to uh, uh, see our, our institutions being targeted time and time and again, and we're lucky that nobody got hurt and, and, and grateful this time, but uh, we can't uh, be so sure that we'll have a similar outcome next time. And that's why we have to take action now. It's heroic that the rabbi decided at some point, I'm gonna throw a chair and help me and my fellow congregants escape. But you don't need to wait until the next emergency situation to be heroic. You can take action now. I start asking these questions and start thinking of yourself as part of the solution. And, and we at CSS, we work with a number of organizations in the Jewish space on security, can help you and give you the tools to, to be involved with that. Okay, so I have like 8 million more questions for you. Uh, and I'm sure that the, the women and men who have joined us on the call do as well. Friends, if you have questions, please uh, type them into the Q&A function at the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom screen. And uh, in just a few minutes, we'll uh, have time to uh, have a free conversation. We'll invite Richard back on. Uh, now, John Podhoritz, if I can uh, elevate you to the screen. So that, um, I mean, I suppose my one question in listening to Richard is that in some sense, the empirical uh, statistics of the frequency of anti-Semitic attacks seems to bear out our impressions that they're happening a lot. But when you zoom out in a larger sense, I wonder if we're reverting to a sort of mean and we're, we're coming out of an exceptional period of, of peace. Or how, how do you understand it? No, I, I, think, I think something new is going on. And just as Jews have come to represent over the last 100, 150 years, the canary in the coal mine uh, as a re re revealing um, the underbellies of the societies in which we live in, through their treatment of, of us, uh, the spate of anti-Semitic incidents that really began, I would say around 2017, 2018, seems to track pretty much a year in advance of a general increase in lawlessness, criminality, um, menace on our streets, um, acts of random violence that have overtaken. I mean, you mentioned in your, in your introduction, these events in Brooklyn, uh, a lot of this really does track with changes in the way we said New York State, New York City has thought and acted on matters of criminal justice, sort of um, releasing demons uh, into the, you know, into the public discourse and into the public sphere because of changes in law and changes in policy, not only 
uh, bail reform and 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 that sort of thing, but also these uh, proposals that are increasingly uh, getting attention about uh, decriminalizing crime, not prosecuting misdemeanor offenses, and that sort of thing. So I, I think that um, uh, wise-minded people should have been looking at what was going on with the Jewish community in the middle to late middle parts of the last decade and said, started there, it's going to come for the rest of us. That's the one, I'm not calling it a positive, but it is the one thing that you can say about um, Jews in America and Jews around the world, which is that um, we're an early warning system about uh, about social degradation among uh, in the in the you know in the worlds in which we we live as as minorities, and I think that's very much what's happened here. Um, and the the kinds of self help or uh, self defense that um, that Richard has been talking about very important because it's increasingly clear that uh, there is a crisis of authority in the United States on these matters and Jews can't wait for good reason to start prevailing in a lot of places. They gotta start making sure that we protect ourselves. I'm not talking about protection in the sense of like the Jewish Defense League of the 60s, which started out exactly as I would think that should start out as a sort of neighborhood watch, you know, as a kind of neighborhood protection watch, block association uh, defense thing, and then sort of expanded out ideologically at a time when there was a lot of <laughs> domestic terrorism into becoming almost a direct domestic terrorist group on behalf of Jewish causes, which was very destructive and, and useless. But Speaking of somebody who, you know, because I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and everybody was very much triggered uh, into self-defense and self-help me measures by 9-11 and the fact that 9-11 happened here and, you know, our schools were hardened, Jewish community centers were hardened, the school that my kids go to, Heschel, is a very, very secure place. There are dozens of security measures that have been taken through, around, beside, and about the school um, that are, by the way, largely invisible to people, people who go to the school, parents who go to the school don't even know that they're there, but they are there to basically make sure that nobody can sort of walk through the door and start shooting in the lobby. Um, uh, and that's very important outside of New York City. Now, the metropolitan New York area uh, constitutes, I think, 40% of the Jewish population in the United States. It is very conscious. We are very conscious of this all over the place. My friend Mitch Silver is now running a uh, the UJA's uh, sort of like local self-help, self-defense organization to help facilitate. He ran the county terrorism, county terrorism department at the New York City Police Department, and they are instructing Jewish institutions on how to do exactly what Richard is talking about. But obviously, there are like places like uh, like Holyville where you know you wouldn't think the, the 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 a place where four people are going to shul on a saturday morning is not a place that's going to have four security it's not going to have four security guards uh, protecting four people in shul and so you know uh the idea that there are going to be soft targets that are going to be easy to hit by maybe an increasingly emboldened anti-Semitic world that can communicate over the internet and pass word to each other and that sort of thing uh, should mean that almost every Jewish institution, every Jewish building, every Jewish organization that is in a building and all of that needs to take a pretty hard look at this and not expect that the civil authorities are going to do the hard work of making sure that somebody doesn't commit a seemingly random act of violence. I mean, I think that that's one of the most interesting and and uh, distressing conclusions that one can draw from Colleyville, which is that it homogenizes or flattens the the risk profile of so many places. I mean, it it would be an exaggeration to say that that uh, the threats of non New York institutions are the same as New York institutions or something. But but everyone is threatened now in, in a way that it seems seems to be uh, it seems to be a new phenomenon. Well, I I, I think. Yeah, you have a guy, you have a guy flies from Britain to do what he did, you know, in Coleyville. But of course, you have somebody who drove to Poway 
and 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 uh, the incident at the Chabad House in Poe, and of course you have the Tree of Life in, in Pittsburgh. Again, is sort of uh, you know someone driving in from out of town to you know hit an institution because it supported the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. I mean, the, right. so um, I, there's no there's no telling what the triggers can be. And there's no reason to think that this is a sort of an organized, it's very easy for one person to cause an astonishing amount of damage and psychic damage. I mean, psychic damage of the sort that you guys were talking about, which is just introducing the idea of a kind of lack of safety into everyday quotidian Jewish life, wherever Jews are living it as Jews, is unbelievably unsettling. I mean, that is like living in Manhattan in the 19s during the crime wave of the 1970s, where you turned a corner and you didn't know whether or not you were safe or unsafe, because everywhere was unsafe, everywhere was menacing. And that's something that could happen um, unless people really do get a sense of security from the behavior of the institutions that take the threat seriously. And I would say, I think Richard's absolutely right that uh, the rabbi in, in Colleyville did something very heroic on, you know, in the way that he behaved, uh, you know, under pressure in the moment, he also let the guy into the building. I mean, we can't forget that he let the guy into the building and he let the guy into the building, I think based on some uh, ideological presupposition that this was his, it was his moral responsibility to, help the stranger who was wandering around in front of the building rather than having that sense of caution or fear or something that would lead him to say, I better lock the door. Who is this guy who was skulking around outside? Now I understand we don't wanna feel that way, particularly if you're a type of liberal Jew and you don't wanna feel that way about a guy who may look like a Muslim wandering around outside your shul but better safe than sorry. And no, no insult is being done to lock the door of a building because you're not quite sure who the guy is outside the door. Everybody who lives in a city understands that. Granted, he lived in Colleyville, so maybe he didn't, but his, his heroism shouldn't blind us uh, to the fact that had he been more um, aware, emotionally aware of the possibility of threat, the entire incident wouldn't have taken place at all. Or at least to to uh, to greet people outside and uh, and speak to them there, rather than inviting them in. There there are other ways to do that because I do think that there's a genuine moral dilemma introduced uh, into the heart of a community that wants to, that wants that sees itself as part of a neighborhood and part of a community and wants to open itself and so on. And uh, and but 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 there is a there is a sort of psychic sense that has to be fine tuned, perhaps. That uh, that we need to secure ourselves, and there that is a dilemma that rabbis are gonna and, and institutional leaders need to um, need to develop. In, in, I don't know. Themselves. Shul seemed very uh, eager and willing, and found it entirely possible to close their doors to Jews over the last two years out of fear of a virus. So I, the notion that you know it therefore becomes a kind of moral stain uh, to act to act cautiously about people you don't know. Uh, in a in a suburb where people are generally not walking around on streets outside your building, um, when you know you 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 sort of made everybody clear seventy two hours worth of COVID testing in order to walk into your building, strikes me as a bit of a cop out. Like in other words, yeah, I understand you want to you want to have a sentimental view of the world in which everybody is friendly and everybody's a friend. I don't think Jews can really uh, afford that at the moment until things calm down. So John, in the in the beginning of your your answer, you identified two strains that I think are of course related, but uh, but I want to pull them apart and ask you to explain each one in turn. Two strains that lead to a general dissolution of civic order. One is cultural, and one is political or legal or has a policy dimension about bail reform and stuff like that. Maybe could could you just explain how these two factors contribute to the dissolution? Well, you know, not to constantly harp back on the 1970s, but one of the, one of the key things that happened in the 1970s was the clear sense among ordinary Americans that the, that the balance had shifted in, in the administration of criminal justice away from the victim and toward the, and toward the criminal, that the rights of the criminal were really a focus of the 
of, of jurisprudence uh, from the 50s through the 80s, that the rights of the criminal, the, the, uh, the, the dangers of, of, of the behavior of police, uh, the injustice of American society causing uh, people to uh, revert to or, or engage in criminality because they had no other path, that kind of thing. Um, and there was a point at which Americans could no longer, could, could take no more of it. They could take no more of it. They threw out people in, in politics all over America, mayors and governors and things like that, who sided with this. And then in the 1980s, there was a massive movement, both among Democrats and Republicans, to revise particularly the federal criminal code to make sure that criminals were punished for their crimes, three strikes laws, um, uh, sentencing, uh, sentencing commissions that set minimum sentences so that judges couldn't go off on their own and decide to free people on the basis of their own whim and that sort of thing. That was what happened the last time we started trending in that direction. The cultural effect is the question of looking through the wrong end of the telescope and, and asking what it is about criminal justice that is a concern to most people and why we should be concerned about it. And that is to provide safety to ordinary citizens. That's why we gather in society is to, is to make sure that we are uh, safe from the depredations of others. And there is an intellectual perversity um, and a deep intellectual tendency, particularly among uh, educated elites of the liberal persuasion to find that boring and retrogressive and to want to get at the root causes of the things that make people do things to others and, and just start focusing on them to the exclusion of the, of the central purpose of criminal justice, which is to defend uh, ordinary people from those who would use uh, violence or the threat of violence against them to get their way. Yeah, so, I mean, it, uh, one, it, it would be an exaggeration to say that, uh, that one hears uh, speeches and, uh, and observes marches dedicated to defunding the police and therefore you have a, a rise of anti-Semitic attacks. But though it would be an exaggeration to draw a direct correlation, uh, a, a direct causation from one to the other, these are obviously related. As a cultural matter, they're obviously related. Uh, look, I would say, as I said at the beginning, it's kind of works in the reverse, which is to say that, which is to say that the attacks came, and then two years later came the marches calling for the defunding of the police. So what's striking about that is that the police were already failing, or at least the criminal justice order that we had that involves police uh, being a sufficient threat or, or, or matter of fear or matter of, of, of deterrence to uh, criminal potential criminal actors had, had, had regressed so much, at least say in parts of Brooklyn, uh that 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 these you know i think mostly young men felt their felt themselves free and safe to commit these barbaric acts of individual uh you know uh, hate crime violence against jews um had they felt more afraid of the authorities uh and what it might mean if they got themselves crosswise of the authorities they would probably have restrained themselves and just sat in their house and talked trash about Jews to their friends and just kept it to themselves. And something let them loose. Things let them loose. And that's a cultural effect. And it's have many, many reasons, because of course, I'm now talking about a specific kind of urban crime, but there is some connection to the to the Poe shooter, to the Tree of Life shooter. These were not, you know, these were these were not, you know. Uh, Brooklyn kids, and there's something there too. But and they also felt as though they had some license that they might not, not they might not otherwise have felt that they had. I mean, this is a very important point because, of course, I would guess that the vast majority of expressions of anti-Semitism are uh, are are brought into the world online in chat rooms and uh, and on social media services, not like you know, Twitter, but, but Gab and other, other places like that. Um, and, and, and that is bad and dangerous and worrisome and, and all of that, but it is not the same as a person who then leaves the basement and goes out into the street and undertakes some action. 
that that's an entirely different order and the uh, dissolution of of civic authority so, seems to make that happen the jews reveal th reveal that um uh, here too i would have a million more questions for you uh but but i see that the uh this earth is spinning on its axis and time is ticking i'd like to invite uh some of the ladies and gentlemen who've joined us to ask your questions please friends type your question into the q a function in the bottom of your screen richard has joined us again caroline what do you have for us Richard had good suggestions that focused on what the community can do, and we clearly need to do things as a community. But what government policies can or should we pursue so that we as a community don't have to bear the brunt of the burden? Jonathan, you want me to start? Yeah, off? please. So, yeah, it's directed at you, so I think you should. <laughs> I, I, my name was in the question, but yeah, you know, so. it's also, you know, pursuing government policies, I also want to stay within my lane. But um, I think a, a few things. One, one thing that I, I would underscore, and I didn't have a chance to mention it earlier, is uh, about the relationship with first responders, right? So this is not necessarily on the, on the national level, and I'll, I'll get to that. But a lot of people think about the need for having first responders when there is an emergency. But what are you doing when there is what we call good weather? Have you invited your local uh, uh, precinct police officers to visit your synagogue? Do they know where the sanctuary is, where the emergency exits are? Do they have a, a floor, for, floor plan on file that you've provided to them? So in the case of an emergency, they know where to go. Are they familiar with some of our customs and traditions? Like I was visiting one of our, our teams in Yom Kippur in an Orthodox shul, and there was a police officer there, very nice person. And I asked him, do you know why people are wearing sneakers today? And, and he had no idea. But anyone from the volunteer security team who was from that community and trained by us would know that if somebody would be showing up with leather shoes at that community, uh, uh, um, you know, it would be suspicious. But by working with your local law enforcement, inviting them over, making sure they know who you are, what your sec security procedures are, what your specific dates are that you might expect, uh, higher attendance and things like that, you can make sure that <clears throat> if, you, if you need them, if there is an emergency, that they can respond faster and as a result, uh, a safe life. And on, on the national level, I do want to point out there's one thing, and I think there's a great uh, 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 name drop of uh, uh, John earlier, of, of our, our colleague, our friend, uh, Mitch Silver, who works in the UJA Federation uh, of New York. And Mitch is part of a network that, uh, uh, of security directors across federations in the United States that can help institutions apply for the federal uh, nonprofit security grant. So there is something called a, a nonprofit security grant. I believe last year in 2021, it was 180 million that is uh, distributed to different institutions that uh, apply for it, that have done a vulnerability assessment that say, hey, we have a playground uh, next to our shoe, but there's, uh, there's no fence and, and they have a, a vulnerability assessment and Mitch or some of the security directors could help with that, uh, have pointed it out. And then you write your grant proposal, you can tap into into those, those funding. And I know that there's an effort by a lot of organizations that do have the mandate to, to advocate for policies to increase the, uh, 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 the, the amount that is part of this nonprofit grant. But it is something that you can, you can think about with your institution. Uh, uh, did, do they know about the nonprofit security grant? Have they done a vulnerability assessment? Are they planning on uh, uh, applying for, for this federal funding? And some states have, have state-specific uh, smaller funds as well. So these are opportunities uh, uh, where you can tap in some of the existing uh, 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 local and federal uh, resources that are available to you. And, and like I said, you don't have to wait until something bad happens. You can you can start doing that now. That was a great answer. So you should don't don't, don't let me uh, bore everybody with my temporizing. So okay, there were several questions related to personal security. For instance, parents with children who wear a kippot or a Jewish star necklaces or jewelry, um, parents want to know how to think about those decisions and how to talk to their kids about preparedness and what it means to be visibly Jewish. Can I say one thing about that? And then I think you, you probably have practical advice. I think it's important to recognize that we are talking about uh, extreme incidents and and very num incidents that in the aggregate are t are vanishingly small, and it's always important when making a risk assessment 
to think about that. The number of times that a person with a kippah is on the street and is not safe will be in the thousands compared to the times that a person with a kippah will be attacked because that person has a kippah. And if you want to live a life in which you imagine that you have a target on your back because you have a kippah on, uh, that is that that goes more to how you assess the world around you in terms of 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 danger. And I just don't think that it's that dangerous on an aggregate day to day basis. And it would be a mistake to to make changes of that sort based on that individual threat, because these are, after all, random acts of violence. Even if they are targeted at Jews, they are still random. Now, if you were the only Jew in a town in Idaho and you were, you know, you were like a Chabad rabbi in Idaho or something like that, and there was a neo-Nazi group around and somebody did something to you, that might be a slightly separate question, but most of us don't live in, you know, live in that kind of isolation. But Richard, what do you what do you say to well, that? Question? I would first I would do double down on what you said, and this is something that's very hard for us. Uh, um, like our mission at CSS is to protect Jewish life, but also the Jewish way of life. You know, and 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 on a personal level, like uh, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. They they walked walked around the street with the Star of David. I was targeted in 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 the Netherlands for 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 being Jewish. Um, I want people to be proud Jews and 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 live life to the fullest. Um, so, you know, there's always, even for institutions, there's going to be a balance, right? Between, I can tell you all the security measures you can take, but you will need to feel comfortable with what level of openness, inclusivity, what do you want to keep? I'm always going to be the one pointing out to the security measures, but it's always going to be a, a decision about how much people feel comfortable with. That said, there are certain practical things that, that people can do. Um, and, and some of it has to do with, with instinct. If, you're, if you have situational awareness and you see that people are falling at you, that you see people are, are, are looking at you and, and you know you have to walk through a, a dark alley or an isolated part of the streets uh, 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 to get to where you need to go, but you have this sort of this gut feeling that, that something is off. Well, why not walk into a, a, a shop or go to a busy part, maybe take an extra 30 seconds? So, I mean, one thing I would say is I'm never going to advise people to not uh, uh, wear anything that identifies them as, as, as Jewish, even if it would potentially in some cases, maybe make them safe because I don't think that's the solution, but you can trust your instincts. And there's also things that are not um, so much on, on the physical realm, but on the online realm that I think all of us can, can talk to our children about. Uh, um, you know, what are their privacy settings on Facebook? What kind of information do they, do they share when they play online video games or they're part of some virtual reality uh, uh, network? Uh, you know, what kind of information about where they live and, and, and what, where they're going that summer are they, are they posting? I think to be to be conscious that everything is public and there's people actively scouting that out that information, not just from an, a hate crime perspective, but can even be criminal. I'm, I'm sure you've heard about stories where uh, uh, someone got a phone call, a grandmother got a phone call that their grandson was injured and they needed to quickly pay a bill. And, and it's often done because of information that is found out online. So on the practical level, uh, uh, you know, have situational awareness. When you when you send something as of trust your instinct, be conscious that even though it's a very small chance, there there is a chance, and don't don't gamble with your own safety, and try to think about the low hanging fruit online, others that you can do now to make yourself less vulnerable, and and you can tell your kids to do as well. Richard, let me follow up on, on that particular. You mentioned uh, that children should not post online, like for example, their summer plans, and and a lot of us. You know, we're, uh, my, my wife and I are just now, we're in the process of like getting camp arrangements made for our kids. So, uh, so we, to, here's... You clarified it. I, I didn't say don't post, but just be, be conscious. No, I understand. Yeah. But, but my question is, if you're going to send your kids to the middle of nowhere, Maine or Pennsylvania or wherever you're going to send them, is that, are, should you feel like they're, they're safer because they're out of the way or it's a softer target because precisely because they're so isolated? Um, it, 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 it's hard. I mean, there have been situations where summer camps in the U.S. were attacked. The, 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 I think the last one I was I'm thinking of was in Los Angeles, 1999, and it was in an, in an urban, an urban area. Obviously, if it's a very remote location, uh, uh, um, you know, it does make it. You know, you're not going to have the passion-induced, uh, 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 impulsive hate crime if you need to travel four hours to get there. But uh, we've also seen that some. 
uh, attacks on our on our institutions have taken in some cases months of preparation. So in that sense, you know, uh, 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 that doesn't exclude the possibility they would also target summer camps. So I would, you know, I would not uh, uh, change any of your your summer plans. I, I also want to be clear. I think if the privacy settings are right uh, on your your children's social media, they can post whatever they you know they can post a lot of things, and they don't have to worry about any of that. But um, uh, you should ask same questions of your of your summer camps as you're asking of your synagogues and schools. Like, do they have security protocols in place? Who is responsible? Have they have they thought about it? Like in some of those remote places you, you mentioned, Maine, um, you know, there, there's a very good database that the Center on Extremism of the ADL has around extremist groups. There are some, you know, nationalist, white supremacist, extremist groups who tend to be very active in areas where, where that we think are, are, are very remote. So uh, I think asking your, your, your summer camp organizers uh, uh, to what extent they, uh, they, they are thinking about security and what kind of precautionary measures they, they, they take, I think is important. But overall, I would, I would deduce that just because of the, the, uh, 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 the difficulty of getting there, the remoteness, it's only a few times a year and not throughout the year that it does overall reduce the, 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 the likelihood. But, you know, uh, coming from a long line of profits, I don't want to prophesize, especially around something this, this, this serious. A lot of our parents have kids on university campuses and they want to discuss how anti-Semitic attacks are handled differently on college campuses where university leaders often take the lead in handling security and there's less involvement of police and other authorities. Um, I mean, I, this is a bifurcated issue where there's a, many, many layers of, of, of these issues because of course there's uh, the issue of anti-Semitic activity on campus that is not violent, that is just rhetorical or is, you know, is defunding BDS, you know, uh, disrupting events, which is, you know, which has, which has a, a, a threat of violence component to it, but doesn't really involve violence, just involves, you know, sort of shutting down speech and all of that. Um, and uh, I, I, I think in those cases, uh, it's a little beyond this remit because uh, Jew the Jewish community, to be fair, I think everywhere has done a pretty extraordinary job of being highly conscious of this kind of these kind of threats and these kind of dangers and putting pressure on administrations at colleges all over the place that uh, respond in ways that I think are morally and and uh, morally unacceptable when it comes to this sort of um, activity. Um, I'm not aware, as I think off the top of my head, of, of cases of actual anti-Semitic criminality uh, on college campuses that, 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 that sort of that, that pop into my head, like some of the ones that we've talked about already. Maybe Richard is more aware of them than I am, or that I'm, I'm just, you know, having a kind of brain freeze about it. I, th I think you're, you're, you're spot on. I think, I think it's, it's, it's hard because there's a lot of... Uh, um, feelings of insecurity around exclusion and, and discrimination and, and, and being treated differently because of being Jewish. And then there's also some, some real targeted hate crimes like you had in, in Syracuse just before COVID hit when there was for, for several weeks, there were like uh, uh, um, swastikas found everywhere. There were specific uh, uh, racist and anti-Semitic uh, uh, files, uh, uh, airdropped as it's called to, to students' phones who were sitting in the library. So you have you you do have some examples of specific uh, uh, acts of hate, including violent acts of hate towards students on campus, and I think it's always challenging because a lot of the security issues on campus have to do around student safety, around treatment of of, of women, of, of of you know safety, irrespective of, of of threats by others, but just general safety. And a lot of universities have their own sort of campus police that can, in some cases, almost operate as their own uh, 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 police department, but. Uh, I'm not aware of any sort of specific threats in the context that we were talking about earlier, and, and I, but I fully agree uh, that it's ultimately, I think there's a lot of great organizations that are, are doing a lot of work around uh, working with students, Jewish students on campus to, to make them feel more safe. Um, um, and, and so I, I don't really have anything else to add there. We probably have time for a final question. Um, how do we prevent these attacks from becoming subsumed under pre-existing political commitments? So for instance, it might be easier for the left to speak 
loudly about the white supremacist in Pittsburgh and harder to speak about um, the African American or Muslim perpetrators. That's an enormous uh, problem. Uh, it is a it's a disgrace, beyond a disgrace. I I don't see uh, outside of um, really egregious players and actors, uh, you know, on the fringe right. I see very little apologetics done for um, extremist acts of anti-Semitic violence um, in, in the United States. I mean, I, there, there is probably a little of it. Um, and, you know, as one of the people who was subjected to the kind of wave of, 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 of anti-Semitic uh, social media garbage in 2015 and 2016, almost all of which came from the right, I am I think it's important for conservatives who are listening to understand that there is a there's a certain presumption on the part of uh, my fellow conservatives that uh, most of the danger and threats uh, that are you know that face the Jewish community today existentially come from the left, and I, I wish that were true, but they it really isn't, and so everybody's got to be conscious. But I see no defense of those people outside of really egregious, as I say, somewhat fringe. Uh, people, uh, that is not true on the left about uh, their, the anti-Semites and people like that who engage in actions. Uh, you had, for example, the, um, there was a weird silence about the Jersey City uh, kosher supermarket uh, uh, slaughter. Um, uh, it seemed almost as though uh, the New York City media and politicians in New Jersey, Democratic politicians in New Jersey, did not want to focus on the fact that this was a, uh, you know, a black on Jewish uh, uh, crime, uh, explicitly so, and to and to do something and to sort of highlight it and talk about the egregiousness of it as we would expect uh, any other form of hate crime of that sort to happen. And this is a this is a, a shame and a tragedy for liberals and the left that they that they are so uh, nervous about their standing with each other and particularly their standing when it comes to supposedly showing their goodwill and bona fides toward um, particularly the African-American community that they that they cannot stand up and um, and make it clear that they will view any such acts as you know as though it were happening to themselves you know this is not just something we should be saying on Pesach you know it's not you know, it's, you know, in every generation, it's as though we came forth out of Egypt. Uh, every attack on every Jew in the United States should be felt by every Jew in the United States as though that were an attack on him or her or their ch or children or their parents or something like that. If you're not a Haredi, it doesn't matter just because you're not wearing a black hat. That doesn't matter. If they knew who you were, if you weren't wearing the black hat, they would be just as happy to do it to you. And there is a real blindness about this and how, how you fix it is that you open a mouth and scream about it. That's the only way you fix it is to name and shame and do what you can as ordinary citizens to let the politicians know and to let the media know and all of that, that their behavior is disgusting to you. And, and, and that does have an effect, I think. Richard, for giving us the uh, practical guidance for what to ask and to whom, and John for giving us this chizuk, this uh, encouragement and boldness to uh, help us recover the sort of courage that our community needs to proudly stand when uh, when we are aggrieved the way that we are. La gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us and for teaching us. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we adjourn. <laughs>